Well, I don't know about you, but my heart has been challenged and encouraged by these young men and women, and I'm excited to see what God will do with them as they continue to serve and to worship Him. Well, if you don't know me, my name's Shannon. I'm one of the pastors here. It's my privilege to share with you a little bit today, and today we're going to be talking about discipleship, so I've asked Abby Retstadt to come and to join with me just share a little bit about how she's discipling others. So Abby, I know you're a busy lady, so why are you intentionally spending some of your time discipling others? Yeah, there's really two really big influences in my life, and the first is that I feel God has called me to this. Um, in Titus 2, 3 through 5, it talks about the older women teaching what is good and um, encouraging younger women to love their husbands and love their children. And so the hardest part of that was like, wow, I'm, I'm the older woman now. <laughs> um, <laughs> But then the second thing is that I had a blessing of growing up with a mom who modeled this beautifully for me. And so we had a home where several women would be coming in and baking cookies, making meals, praying, and um, looking at the Bible with my mom. And so these ladies became a part of our family. So, so how, did you, how did God lead you to disciple these two young ladies with Olivia and Stephanie? Yeah, um, it's definitely God's timing and God's doing. Um, I've got six children that I homeschool up to eighth grade, and um, so I've been busy, but um, I only have one left at home now, and so God was really laying it on my heart that, Abby, it's time for you to invest in people outside of your, your immediate family, and so I started to pray, and I just prayed, Lord, would you connect me with young women who really need to be encouraged, and it wasn't long after that that Olivia and I met for breakfast and she just mentioned you know i really would like to be mentored and i've got this new best friend that would like to be mentored and um so it was god's doing definitely so what do you guys do when you get together we try and meet every other week and our our primary goal is to encourage each other as wives and moms and so while my daughter who's still being homeschooled uh, watches their five kiddos in our basement we grab a cup of coffee and we just share life. We share the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, we listen and we encourage and we pray with each other. And um, really because both of these ladies have Bible studies outside of this, uh, we've chosen to make ours very light. And we've covered lots of subjects. And recently we just finished a book uh, by Nancy DeMoss called Choosing Gratitude. So as you kind of reflect a little bit, what are some of the benefits that you've seen from investing this time and spending this time together? Yeah, first, I have gained two precious friends. Um, and then in addition, God is so graciously made an environment where it is safe and it's okay to be real and, and share the dirt. And so I like it, it to being able to get in a mud puddle. And, but we don't stay there. We pull each other out and we move forward by applying God's principles and God's wisdom to the circumstances. And so it has been just a sweet blessing to see God answer prayer and um, to see lives spiritually grow and uh, personal victories happen. Well, Abby, I just wanna say thanks for taking some time and sharing with us a little bit about what God's been doing in and through you as you've been working with these ladies. Well, we're going to continue our sermon series this morning. We're in the middle of a sermon series that we've entitled Unsinkable. And when the, you know, the tagline is, when the ship is sinking, hold on to the one who walks on water. And so we started two weeks ago talking about unsinkable worship. Last week, we talked about unsinkable fellowship. And this week, we want to talk about unsinkable discipleship. Now, I got to be honest, discipleship is not a word that you hear a lot. In fact, I don't know that I've ever heard it outside of a church context. Most of the time, we talk about it at church. And when we hear the word disciple, it has this idea that someone is a student, they're an intern, they're, they're kind of like an apprentice. And so in Jesus' time, a, a disciple would follow a rabbi, they would follow a teacher, and what they would do is they would basically live with them. Wherever the rabbi would go, the, the disciple would go as well. And as they went along the way, the rabbi would teach them. And they would observe everything that the rabbi was doing, and they would gradually, the hope was, as you spent time with the rabbi, you became more and more like that rabbi until you knew everything the, the rabbi did and you did everything the way the rabbi did. So this morning, I want to suggest to you that we are here to be disciples of Jesus and we're here to make disciples of Jesus. If you forget everything else, I want you to remember this. You are here on earth to be a disciple of Jesus 
and to make disciples of Jesus. And we're gonna look at how first, before we can make a disciple, we've gotta be a disciple. Then we're gonna look at how we need to obey Jesus' command to make disciples. And if we're gonna do that, we've gotta be really intentional or it just doesn't happen. So we're gonna start this morning by talking about how first you have to make, before you can be a disciple, you have, I just said that wrong. Before you can make disciples, you have to be a disciple. There you go. All right, so we're going to start by looking at how did Jesus say to become one of his disciples? In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, he says this. He says, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. And I want you to think, can you imagine if a king was coming with his army and they were coming for you? What would you do? I think if it was me, the first thing I would do is try and figure out, okay, can I defeat the king and the army? And if I can't, then what do I need to do to make peace before they come? You see, we have a king, our king is God, and he's coming, and we need to be ready. Jesus said we had to repent, we had to turn from what we were doing, because none of us naturally pursue God, and we need to go the opposite way and to start to follow him. The reason is, is that we're sinners, we've got a problem, and we need a savior. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Most of us are pretty comfortable admitting that we're not perfect, that we need God's help. The problem is, is that if we fall short of that standard, Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. When God our King comes, I deserve death. And on my own, that's exactly what I'm going to get. Because there's nothing that I can do to be good enough to earn anything but death. But there's an amazing truth, there's a great truth. In Romans 5, 8, it says this, but God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God loves us, and Jesus loves us, and Jesus paid the penalty for my sin and for your sin so that we can have a relationship with God, that our sins can be forgiven. The rest of Romans 6, 23 says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God offers us eternal life even though we deserve death, an eternal separation from him. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What a glorious thought. I was talking to someone after our first service who watched his mother pass away on Friday. They said it was a glorious time as they were praising God together and realized that she is now in eternity because she confessed Jesus as Lord. Now, if we're going to confess Jesus as Lord, that means we need to treat him as Lord as well. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for you are saved by grace through faith, it's not from yourselves, it's a gift of God, not works, so no one can boast. All salvation requires is faith. When we confess Jesus Lord, it means that he's in control, that he's our boss, that we work for him, that our lives are dedicated to doing whatever he leads us to do. He's our master. The first step to become a disciple is to accept salvation by faith. The second step is we need to be obedient to what Jesus calls us to do. Each day I serve Jesus, hopefully I become more and more like him because God transforms my heart so that I think and act the way that he does. But the reality is I can't be a true disciple of Jesus and ignore what he said his disciples do. In John 13, 34 to 35, Jesus says, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you must also love one another. By this all People will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If we're true disciples of Jesus, we have to choose to love others, not just the ones we like, even the ones that drive us crazy. With God's help, we can choose to love them because God's love has transformed my heart and gives me the capacity to love others as well. Got to be honest with you this morning, though, there's a significant cost to being a disciple. If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 16. You want to use your pew Bible, it's on page 902. And I want you to understand and listen to what Jesus said was the cost of being his disciple 
I'm in Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to start here in verse 24. This is what Jesus says. If anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. What will it benefit a man if he gains the whole world yet loses his life? Or what will a man give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will reward each according to what he has done. You know, when the disciples heard this, they instantly understood what it meant to carry a cross because they watched people carry part of their cross to their place of execution. Being a disciple means Jesus is our Lord and Master, and we willingly follow him wherever he leads, even if that's to our physical deaths. You see, two disciples are willing to die because they understand what they have gained. One day, Jesus is returning with his angels and his Father's glory, and he's going to reward us. And his reward will outweigh anything that we have sacrificed to follow him here on this earth. You know, for uh, Lynn, when I was talking to him today, his mom experienced that reward on Friday when she went home to be with her Lord and Savior. That's the future for all of us. Our time on this earth will come to an end. And my hope is that each one of us will hear, well done, good and faithful servant on that day. But I get to ask you this morning, are you a true disciple of Jesus? Have you ever placed your faith in him? Have you ever confessed with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord? Have you committed to following wherever he leads? It's a tremendous offer that God gives each one of us. But each of us has to choose to take it. Do you really believe that Jesus will reward you if you follow him? Do you understand that his offer is eternal life in paradise with him? This morning we're talking about our need to be disciples and to make disciples for Jesus. First, we have to be a disciple before we can make a disciple. And second, we have to obey Jesus' command. If you still are in Matthew, turn back a little bit to Matthew chapter 28. It's on page 918 in your pew Bible. But this is Jesus, and he's talking to his disciples. This is after they have, Jesus had died, and he rose from the dead, and he's preparing to go back to heaven. And before he leaves his disciples, he leaves them with these instructions. And I'm going to pick up here in Matthew 28, verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus had spent three years with his disciples. They walked with him. They talked with him. They watched him do miracles. They watched him walk on water, feed the 5,000. They watched him rise from the dead. And now he's leaving and he says, now it's your turn. You need to go and make disciples. Go make followers of me. And I think Jesus gives that same command to us. And it's a command. It's not a suggestion. When you look at the original Greek, it's a little bit easier to understand. And, and it's this idea of as you are going. In other words, as you are living life, whatever you're doing, wherever you go, you need to make disciples. Disciples. This is what we're called to do. And the good news is, God doesn't just call us to do it, he equips us to do it. And the first thing that he gives us to equip us is he gives us the example of Jesus. When you study the Gospels, when you look at Jesus' life, you can see how he lived and what he did, and so we can follow that same example. He also gives us the scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, which includes making disciples. The Bible is our guide for what we should do and how we should do it. It's where we find truth. It's where we can teach truth. Not only do we have scripture and the example of Jesus, but God also promised that we would have the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in John 13 that when he goes, he will send the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9 and 8, 11 says that if we are believers in Jesus, the Holy Spirit indwells us and it will guide us and help us to live for God. The last thing that God gives us is one another. There are over 30 one another commands in the New Testament. Things like 
Bear one another's burdens, forgive one another, encourage one another, admonish one another, and the one that's the most common, love one another. God doesn't just ask us to make disciples. He gives us everything that we need to be helpful. You know, my grandmother had a great impact on my life. She began discipling me before I even knew what discipling was. First ministry I ever did is I went with her. She used to go and teach a Bible club at a housing project that wasn't far from where we lived. And I watched her love on kids and teach them about Jesus. She'd take me with her to go visit her mom, and I watched her sacrificially love her mom as she deteriorated in her older age. I watched her pray for me and for my cousins and the rest of the family. I watched her read the Bible. I watched her give her time and her resources to others. And it wasn't just family. It was friends and neighbors, whoever was in need. Long before I felt God calling me to a pastor, my grandmother taught me what it meant to disciple and train others. She has four children and 12 grandchildren. Her four children and the 10 of the 12 grandchildren that are married are all still married. It's highly unusual in our culture today. But I think a lot has to do with the example that my grandmother set and how she intentionally discipled her children and her grandchildren and pointed them to God. What about you this morning? Are you obeying God's command to disciple others? That's what you're here on earth for. What is keeping you from sharing with others the hope and what you know about Jesus and how he can make a difference in others' lives? Will you choose to obey God's command to disciple others? You know, that's what we're here for, to be disciples and disciple others. But you've got to be intentional. It's not something that just happens. Sometimes it's hard. We try to intentionally disciple others and they may reject us. But if you remember, not everybody followed Jesus when he was here either. But even when we're being rejected, we have the responsibility to share the truth and the hope that we know. If you got your Bible, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4 in this. Paul is giving some instructions to Timothy about how he should live his life and what difference would be. And we're going to see how, if we're really going to be intentional, we have to set the example. So we're in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. It's page 1092 in your pew Bible. Follow along as I read. Let no one despise your youth. Instead, you should be an example to the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, give your attention to public reading, exhortation, and teaching. Do not neglect the gift that is in you. It was given to you through prophecy with the laying on the hands by the council of elders. Practice these things. Be committed to them so that your progress may be evident to all. Pay close attention to your life and your teaching. Persevere in these things. For by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, with all propriety, the younger women as sisters. I want you to think for a minute. Set the example in speech. How'd you use your words this week? Build others up or tear them down? Set the example in conduct. Be above approach in all that you did this week. Set the example in love. Now, I was out at a soccer game yesterday. Sometimes it's hard to love the official (laughs) and the coach and the opposing team. But all joking aside... How, love, how much love did you show to those that were difficult for you to love this week? Set the example in faith. How did your coworkers see your faith this week? Set the example in purity. If I were to put up on this big screen everything that you watched or thought about this past week, would it be pleasing to God? He goes on to talk about public reading, exhortation, and teaching. To be focused on those things. Is that your focus this week? Or was it TV, movies, Snapchat, Instagram? What are we really focused on? We want to pay close attention to our life and our teaching. We need to persevere in these things. 
You know, the challenge is I've got three kids. And I set an example for them. Part of the problem is I don't always set the best example. I wish they would always follow my good example. But guess what? Sometimes they pick up on the not so good example as well. You know what? It's not just my kids. It's my coworkers. It's my neighbors. It's others that we come in contact with. And we don't have to be perfect. None of us are. It's okay to fail. But what do we do when we fail? Do we admit our fault? Do we seek reconciliation? Do we seek forgiveness? Can we say what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11.1? 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ? Wow, that's a high standard. But that's our goal. That's what I want to be able to say. We want to live like Jesus to treat people with love and kindness and grace and forgiveness. Whatever we know about God, we need to be setting that example for others to follow. Not only that, but we need to teach the truth. Paul also writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2, What you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Do you get it? Paul's saying, hey, you've learned from me. I've mentored you. I've encouraged you. Now, I want you to take what you've learned and trust that to others, not just for them, but so that they can entrust that to others as well. You know, I love to preach and to teach. And I love to do that because it forces me to learn and to grow and to learn from others. I don't think I've ever had an original thought in any lesson I've ever taught. It's all been something that somebody else has taught me. I desperately need to keep learning and growing. Not only do I need to keep learning and growing, but I need to be intentionally giving what I know to others so that they can keep teaching others so on and on it goes. But it doesn't happen naturally. We've got to be intentional about it. Moses wrote these words in Deuteronomy 6, 6 6-9, telling the Israelites how to teach their children about God. This is what he says. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Starts with your own heart. Then he goes on and says, repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Parents, if you're showing up once a week with your kids here at church hoping that they're going to learn about God, you're sadly mistaken. If we are not talking to our kids when we're picking them up from practice, when we're getting breakfast in the morning, when we're hanging out at the house, they're never going to learn and understand the truth that you know about God. And that doesn't just go for kids. That goes for our neighbors, for our coworkers. Whatever we are doing, we need to be pointing people to Jesus. That's what life is all about. We need to teach the truth, but we also need to love like Jesus did. Jesus is the perfect example of what love really looks like. And if we want to influence people for God, we got to love the way he did. 1 John 4, 7 to 11 says this, Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. God's love was revealed to us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we must love one another. We love because he first loved us. It's the one command that is, commi- uh, is, is the most in the New Testament. It's love one another. 1 John 3, 16 to 18 says it this way. This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also da- lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has this world's good and sees his brothers in need but closes his eyes to his need, how can God's love reside in him? Little children, we must love with word. We must not love with word or speech, but with truth and action. We need to be willing to lay down our lives for others. We need to be willing to invest the resources we have to help others who are in need. Yesterday, our middle school and high school students went out and they fed and ministered to the homeless here in Columbus. Every Saturday, there's a group from the church that goes out and they minister to the homeless. 
They're meeting needs. They're investing their resources. They're trying to love them the way that Jesus did. We need to be willing to do that as well. You know, often we teach things without even trying to. My wife loves to plant flowers. She was planting flowers yesterday in between soccer games. She learned that because her grandmother enjoys that, her mother enjoys that. I've intentionally helped my son to become an Eagles fan. Very proud of that fact, right? Well, my great-grandfather and my grandfather and my dad and my uncles are all Eagles fans. Think for a moment. How many of you are a Buckeyes fan because somebody intentionally pointed you to the Buckeyes and got you excited about that? So if we can do that with something as ridiculous as flowers and sports, why can't we do that for something as significant as Jesus and what matters for all eternity. Earlier, Abby shared how she was intentionally discipling Olivia and Stephanie, how she was trying to set the example for them, trying to teach the truth and trying to love them like Jesus did. So I gotta ask, what about you? Who and how are you discipling? Are you being intentional? Are you passing on to others what you know about Jesus and the hope and the meaning that your life has because you know him? Reality is all of us have a wide variety of relationships with different people. Every relationship is an opportunity that we have to disciple someone else, to point them to Jesus. God has connected you with other people. What are you doing with those connections? We not only need to disciple others, but the reality is each of us needs somebody to be discipling us. Who is discipling you? Who is challenging you and encouraging you to grow in your faith? Is there someone that you know that you go, man, I wish I had faith like they did? Why not ask them to help you, to spend time with you? You know, for a lot of us, that's what it comes down to, doesn't it? Time. If we're not careful, we can invest our time in all kinds of things that make no difference for eternity. Do you need to free up some of your time this week by saying no to things that aren't that significant so that you can disciple others or be discipled to do something that really matters for all eternity? As we get ready to close this morning, I wanna remind you that you are here to be a disciple and to make disciples. First question I've gotta ask is, are you a true disciple of Jesus? Each of us is broken, each of us is sinful, each of us needs to be afraid because our sin separates us from God. But the good news is God's taking care of that for us. He sent Jesus to die on the cross, paid the penalty for my sin, for your sin. We don't have to be afraid, we have to accept the gift that God offers. If you've never done so before this morning, I implore you, I challenge you, I encourage you. I don't know how I can say it stronger. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Yes, there's a high cost. Yes, it's difficult. But we've got something so much better coming. And we can be confident of our future when we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But guys, you gotta be honest. Is Jesus really your Lord and Savior? Are you willing to follow wherever he leads? Are you obeying his commands? Are you living for him? You see, Jesus doesn't just suggest that we should go and make disciples. He commands us to go and to make disciples. So this morning, I know many of you know Jesus and are disciples of his, but I gotta ask you, are you obeying his command? Are you being intentional? That last part is the hard part, right? Are we intentionally setting the example? Are we intentionally teaching the truth? Are we intentionally loving Jesus? Can you say, as Paul did, imitate me as I imitate Christ? That's the goal. Are you loving the way Jesus did? Think about it for a moment. How and who are you actually discipling? Who 
is it that God wants you to invest in this week? Who is it that you can share the truth of what you know about God? Wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you know more than other people that you know. And you can share with them the hope and the meaning that only comes from knowing God. Maybe it's your child, maybe it's your parent, maybe it's a sibling, a coworker. Who is it that God wants you to disciple and to be intentionally sharing with about him this week? Finally, who's discipling you? I don't care how old you are, I don't care how much you know, the more I learn, the more I realize I've got so much to know. This sometimes is the harder one to find. Sometimes it's easier to find people that we can share with, but to find somebody that can help us. If you've got somebody like that in your life, I encourage you this week, spend time with them. Make it a priority. If you don't have somebody in your life, look around. Who is it that you want to be like? Who's following Jesus in a way that you want to follow Jesus? And I know this would be gutsy. Walk up to them, or if you're a kid, text them. Right? And ask them if they would be willing to invest in you, to spend time with you. Who needs to be discipling you so that you can grow and become the person that God wants you to be? Bow with me as I pray. Father, thank you this morning for challenging our hearts, for challenging our minds, for reminding us of the love that you have for us. Lord, we thank you because we can't come to you on our own. Our best is never good enough. But Lord, you take our sin away because of what Jesus did on the cross. You've shown us what love is. You loved us when we wanted nothing to do with you, and I, I still can hardly comprehend that. Lord, I pray if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, that they would talk to me, they talk to anybody that was on the stage this morning to really understand what it means to love you and to follow you, but to be a true disciple. Lord, for many of us, I know we're already your disciples, but help us to live out your commands. Help us to choose to obey your command to make disciples of others. Help us to be intentional. Whoever it is that you've laid on our hearts this morning, help us to spend time with them this week, sharing the hope that we have because of you. Father, all of us need help. You've given us each other to help, so Lord, help us to be humble, to go to somebody else if we don't already have somebody in our life that's mentoring us, and ask them to invest in us so that we can continue to grow and to develop in our faith. Lord, we praise you and thank you because you are a good God, that you give us everything that we need to obey your commands and to live them out, and you use us to make a difference for all eternity. What a blessing that is. We want to give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor this morning. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm convicted giving this because now I have to live out what I say. And so I want to encourage you as you leave, God doesn't ask you to do something that's impossible. He gives us everything that we need to be able to do it. These are the words that we find at the end of Hebrews 13. It says this, Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, with the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with all that is good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Glory belongs to him forever and ever. Amen. Well, I hope your heart was encouraged, and we'll look forward to gathering again together next week.